first. Oh, okay. Blessed be our God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 52, beginning with the 13th verse. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouth because of him. For that which had been... That which had not been told them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before them, before him, like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised. And we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruises, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that was led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, He was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make your life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. 
He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 22. You can find it on page 610 of the Book of Common Prayer. Let us read it responsively. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me and are so far from my cry and from the words of my distress? Oh, my my God, God, I I cry cry in the the daytime, daytime, but but you you do do not answer. answer. By By night as well, but I I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Our Our forefathers forefathers put put their their trust trust in in you. you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and no man, scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and wag their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let Let him him deliver him. him. Let Let him him rescue him him if he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb and kept me safe upon my mother's breast. I have have been been entrusted entrusted to you ever since I was born. born. You were my God when I was still in my my mother's mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. Many young bulls encircle me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their jaws at me like a ravening or a roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart within my breast is melting wax. My mouth is dried out like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth, and you have laid me in the dust of the grave. Packs of dogs close me in, and gangs of evildoers circle around me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. They cast lots for my clothing. Be not not far far away, O Lord. You are my strength. strength. Hasten Hasten to help me. Save me from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save Save me me from from the the lion's lion's mouth, mouth. my wretched body from the horns of wild bulls. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Praise Praise the the Lord, Lord, you that fear him. him. Stand in awe of him, O offspring of Israel. All you of Jacob's line, give glory. For he does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty, neither does he hide his face from them. But when they cry to him, he hears them. My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall bow before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. 
To him alone, all who sleep in the earth bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust fall before him. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn the saving deeds that he has done. The New Testament reading is from the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 10, beginning with the 16th verse. The Holy Spirit testifies, saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. (laughs) The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Now Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples then entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, They stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. 
Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, you are not also one of the man's disciples, are you? Peter said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, if I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, you are not also one of the disciples, are you? Peter denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning, and they themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, we are not to, permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? But they shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wore a crown of thorns and wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. 
they kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. Then Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at the palace called the stone pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of the preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him with two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and, my clothing, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then Jesus said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. 
After this, when Jesus knew that all was finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. Then Jesus, when Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because the Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a sword, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may also believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in that garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, the tomb was ready, and the tomb was ready, and nearby they laid Jesus there. Earlier in the week, at the, at the supper at Simon the leper's house, we heard about the woman, the unnamed woman, who came in with the alabaster jar full of costly perfume and came and anointed Jesus. And how the, those nearby said, she's spending so much money on this oil. Why is it wasted? That money could have been taken to the poor and given to the poor. And Jesus said, no, what she has done is a good thing, a good thing for me. She's preparing my, my body for its burial. This was long before any of the, the arrest or anything, or even the threat by the Sadducees and the Pharisees. But G- and Jesus said, wherever the gospel is preached, she will be remembered. And what she has done will be re- rem- remembered and proclaimed. She has done for me a good thing. And now, today, we hear about Joseph of Arimathea and, and Nicodemus, who came at night, both secret disciples of Jesus, And they came and took the body and cared for it so lovingly and laid it in the tomb. In all four Gospels, we have the woman who comes and anoints Jesus. And in all four Gospels, we have Joseph of Arimathea. Bookends to this whole event. 
people who cared for Jesus, cared for his body and prepared it for, for burial. Along the way, there are other unnamed people. Today, we heard about the, the two thieves. Well, in, that, in John's gospel, they're not called thieves. They're just criminals. They're on either side of Jesus. And in the other gospels, we hear the one deriding Jesus, just like everyone else. If you're the king of the Jews, save us. Take, come down from your cross and save us too. And the other one who said, do you not fear God? We're getting our just desserts, our rewards for our criminal activity. But this man was innocent. And in Luke's gospel, Jesus, or the, the thief says, Jesus, remember me in paradise. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, I, today you will be with me in paradise. So many things, so many people. God. We also hear in all four Gospels the women stayed with Jesus even at the crucifixion. They all witnessed it. They all, Mary Magdalene in all four Gospels was there witnessing the cruel death and laying the body in the tomb. I name all those people, talk about all those people because their lives were changed by what they experienced and what they saw. They knew Jesus in his ministry and his loving care and his healing and his, his divine preaching and his, his wonderful lessons and how to care for others, even your enemies and then watched him live that out and die that out by loving his enemies even to the end, even in that brutal death. Their lives were changed and the life of the entire world was changed because of these events. Usually, when I read these, I imagine myself as, you know, maybe one of the women or the, the beloved disciple who witnessed and didn't leave. But I know in my heart of hearts, I'm more like Peter, denying Jesus three times, denying that I ever knew him. And other times I imagine I'm just like one of, those, one of the people in the crowd, crucify him, come on down, prove yourself to be the king, come off the cross and drive these Romans out. But this year I'm struck by the fact that uh, I may be one of the criminals. We all have that in us too. One of the criminals crucified alongside of Jesus. And that innocent man died for us too. Died for those criminals too. even the one who berated him. Even at the end, their lives were changed and touched by this innocent man. There can be no doubt that this was an awful, brutal, cruel death. So often the crosses we, we see around or the crosses we wear around our necks or the crosses we parade around with are beautiful. 
not Jesus' cross. It was hard and hand-hewn, <coughs> and it was not milled or sanded smooth. It was rough and splintery. And the weight of his body dug those splinters into his skin. And the spikes were not surgical steel. And surely the hammer was heavy. And the thorns, painful. They were not lovingly placed on his head like, uh, like a crown on the king. And they weren't, it wasn't like Napoleon taking the, the, the crown and putting on his head just right. It was put on with great force. Digging in, probably all the way to the bone. And even the trial was not one like we would imagine a trial to be with great solemnity and proper uh, procedures and Robert's rules of order and, and, uh, and innocent until proven guilty, habeas corpus, or any other law except the law of power and avarice and, um, and fear and retribution. This man came to change the world. This man was inspired by God to change the world. This man was God. And God is continually changing the world. This whole week, we've witnessed um, another trial scene. The, the trial that, result, that is going on in Minneapolis after the death of George Floyd. And did you, have you heard every witness on that day? Every witness at some point in their testimony broke down. The then 17-year-old, now 18-year-old girl who, who captured the whole uh, scene on her phone and sent out the video that the world might know what happened she broke down, and still, a year later, she cries herself to sleep at night and prays to George Floyd for forgiveness because <laughs> she couldn't do anything but, but capture it on film. Or the off-duty EMT, emergency technical, uh, emergency medical technician who witnessed it and recognized the signs of a man, a person in, in distress and knew that he needed attention, medical attention, or that he would lose his life. And her pleas went unbidden by the police officer, officers. She broke down on the witness stand in her frustration and in her powerlessness and watched this man die. When she was questioned by the, uh, uh, the defense attorney uh, about whether or not she was getting angry and, and to, so that the police officer might be justified by feeling that he was being, uh, his life was being threatened by the crowd. She said, have you, never, have you ever seen a man die? It's a frightful thing. It's made me desperate 
because I could have helped and I wasn't allowed to. It's a desperate situation. The man who uh, worked at the store, who complained about the, 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 the forged money to his manager and didn't want to say anything really, didn't want to follow through, but the manager made him call the police, he still feels guilt because over a $20, a fake $20 bill and a pack of cigarettes, this man lost his life. He broke down on the witness stand. This was a terrible, terrible event and a terrible, terrible death and an unnecessary death. And everyone so far who has taken the witness stand is in some degree of trauma. Our nation, too, is in trauma. The world is in trauma. Now we know that George Floyd was a human being and flawed and a sinner. And he did in fact have a forged $20 bill. But his life was certainly worth more than a forged $20 bill. And yet, we too know that we, if we had been there, we too would have been powerless. And if we really, really are honest with ourselves, there's part of us who would have had our back as well. Because power is addictive. And the threat of losing power is the deepest fear. So this day, we remember the death of an innocent man at the hands of, of government and at the, at the behest of a fearful hierarchy. And we know our own guilt in all of this, our own complicity in all of this. But we know that that innocent one died for each of us, even in our complicity even in our denial, even in our participation. That one died for the one on, the, one on his right who derided him and the one on his left who pleaded with him for forgiveness. That one the women at his feet and the beloved disciple who did not run away. And for the centurion who drove in the nails. That one died for all those who passed by and him and 
for the ones who broke their, his companion's legs. That one died. and compassion and forgiveness and mercy on the chief priests and on Pilate and on Joseph and Nicodemus. That one died to heal and to forgive. Because without forgiveness, there is no real healing. That one died for the sake of Derek Chauvin and for George Floyd. And that one died for all those who witnessed and could do nothing. Who were utterly helpless on that day, God's self died, helpless, powerless. On that day, God, as we imagine him, died. The all-powerful, almighty, omnipresent one died. And they wrapped that vision of God in costly oils and in fine linen and laid him in the earth where he belongs. The true God is the one powerless and lives and abides with the powerless ones. The true God does not ride a, a war horse. The true one, the true God, walks barefoot with those who cannot afford, choose. The true God does not eat splendid meals, but abides with the ones who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who hunger and thirst. The true God, the Almighty One, does not uh, take whatever that one can get. The true God gives and gives and gives until there is no more to give. Today we remember God emptying, being emptied of all power and might and strength and breath.
Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for our bishop and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, for those about to be baptized, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them. For Joseph, the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded and the crippled, for those in loneliness, fear and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives and those in mortal danger, that God in God's mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of God's love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to them in their needs. Gracious God, the comforter of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for, for the sake of him who suffered for us, our son, your Son, our Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those who have lost their faith, for those hardened by sin or indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, and for those who in the name of Christ have per persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Mm -hmm. 
Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock, under one shepherd, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us now commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O oh God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. And let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made. Your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. It is nothing to you, all you who pass by. Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which is brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. Holy, holy God, God, holy and mighty, mighty holy and mortal one, have, have mercy, mercy on us. us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what have I done to you? Or in what have I offended you? Testify against me. I led you forth from the land of Egypt and delivered you by the waters of baptism. But you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy, holy God, God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. I led you through the desert 40 years and fed you with manna. I brought you through tribulation and penitence and gave you my body, the bread of heaven. But you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy, holy God, God, holy and mighty, 
Holy Immortal One, have mercy upon us. I went before you in a pillar of cloud, and you have led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I scourged your enemies and brought you to a land of freedom, but you have scourged, mocked, and beaten me. I gave you the water of salvation from the rock, but you have given me gall and left me thirsty. Holy God, holy, holy and mighty, holy, holy immortal, immortal one, have, have mercy, mercy on us. I gave you a royal scepter and bestowed the keys to the kingdom, but you have given me a crown of thorns. I raised you on high with great power, but you have hanged me on the cross. Holy, holy God, God holy, holy and mighty, holy, holy and immortal one, one have, have mercy upon, upon us. My peace I gave, which the world cannot give, and washed your feet as a sign of my love. But you draw the sword to strike in my name and seek high places in my kingdom. I offered you my body and blood, but you scatter and deny and abandon me. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. I sent the spirit of truth to guide you, and you close your heart to the counselor. I pray that all may be one in the Father and me, but you continue to quarrel and divide. I call you to go and bring forth fruit, but you cast lots for my clothing. Holy, holy God, God, holy and mighty, holy, holy immortal one, have, have mercy upon us. I grafted you into the tree of my chosen Israel, and you turned on them with persecution and mass murder. I made you joint heirs with them of my covenants, but you have made them scapegoats for your own guilt. Holy, holy God, God, holy, holy and mighty, holy, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. I came to you as the least of your brothers and sisters. I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you <coughs> gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Holy, holy God, God, holy, holy and mighty, holy, holy immortal, immortal one. one. Have mercy upon us.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. Oh, 